Welcome back to Long Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We are live right now in a major trial that we've been covering here on the network, the Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum trial out of Georgia. The two former foster care parents who are accused of abusing two girls that were in their care, Layla Marie Daniel and Millie Daniel. Now, the question, of course, is did not only did they inflict this abuse, but are they really responsible for the death of two-year-old Layla? That became the question. Their defense is saying this little girl choked on a piece of chicken. That's how she died. These two people tried to help resuscitate her. That's why you see any of these injuries. But the medical evidence that has been put forward by the state has seemed to suggest that's not the case that this really was abuse, this was neglect, and we have seen witness after witness for the state to show that and substantiate that. On the stand right now is a different kind of witness, a psychotherapist who's a forensic examiner, most likely is the person who interviewed Millie after her sister died. Let's see what she had to say. Well, this is a good preview of what she's gonna be testifying to. The thing that gets me is how delicate her job is to interview these children, uh, interviewing Millie, I'm assuming she interviewed Millie after Layla died. That seems like an impossible task. Um, what are you gaining from her intro, her introduction about this? I think that the prosecutor is doing a very good job of highlighting a few things. The first thing, the difficulties with interviewing a child and why that may be difficult. The fact that uh, the younger a person is, the more that suggestion can affect their responses to questions. I mean, she's doing a very good job of trying to outline the protocol and to kind of make it difficult for the defense to say that this was done improperly. Like, she's stealing the thunder. I was just about to say that. So what would defense say? I mean, she's explaining her whole protocol, avoiding suggestible questions. Is the defense going to be in a difficult position to say something was done incorrectly? Uh, because based upon what we've seen so far, whatever Millie told her is probably going to hurt the defend defendants. Right. I mean, I could already hear the cross in my mind. You know, you, the, there's no such thing as a perfect forensic interview. Interviewing children is difficult. You interviewed this child twice, and on both occasions, you did not follow protocol. Now, at that point, you can step away, but if you ask that next question, why did you not follow protocol? The answer might be bad. I would also yes. imagine that they would say, you know, have you seen any inconsistent statements in what Millie told you, which is a big thing as well. Uh, let's jump back live. And again, we're waiting for the real crux of this testimony to begin and what Millie had to say to her. Norman, that was a big point at the very last, when they're talking with the state is saying, well, is it possible that this is why the children might have had warmer feelings towards Joseph as opposed to Jennifer saying that he's just a, he's just stand, he stood by and watched the abuse as opposed to Jennifer, who's really portrayed as the, the evil person in this, the person who's most responsible for the abuse, the one who inflicted this. What are your thoughts on that? I guess it's important so that the jury understands why the level of liability is different from Joseph to Jennifer. I think that's important. It's also important to, I guess, to just draw that bright line and, and let the jurors know that this isn't unusual. And that if Millie were to say something kind about Joseph, doesn't mean that he's excused. Right. Doesn't mean that he's not culpable for what happened. Okay, so according to her, it's not uncommon for somebody in Millie's position to not talk about the abuse first and foremost and explain what happened to her. It's very common. Is that a credible uh, analysis? Do you believe her on that? Do I believe the psychotherapist? Yes. Um, yes, I do. I do. I mean, that's true with adults. So with kids, even more so. So what's the defense going to do here? Because that was the, the part that the state was having trouble with, where Millie didn't come forward and didn't say that Jen or Jennifer or Joseph was abusive. Now they're trying to get around that. Right. I mean, but the defense has to be careful because you have to be careful. You, you can't blame a child for something. You know, they have to be very careful. They have to tread lightly. And where she says, you know, you were talking about how Millie knew that Layla had died before the ambulance got there. You're stating that a three or four year old knew that the child was dead, that they have that concept. What is she trying to get at here? Well, she's trying to discredit a, her whole line of testimony. You know, she began by suggesting that there was a, a mountain of evidence that she could have reviewed before she interviewed Millie, but she did not. Right. That she limited her, her, uh, her discovery. Um, review and that maybe that was a mistake. 
Well, it's an interesting witness. I see where the state's going. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll jump live, and maybe she's going to still be on the stand. Stay tuned. I mean, that's pretty strong. You get somebody that knows her very well, former friend, talks about this being a facade, uh, wanted to give her the benefit of the doubt. The impact that a jury, that has on a jury. Huge impact. Because they're listening from, uh, they're listening to a witness that actually knows the defendants personally and has an opinion about them. Has a has a desire to want to believe her friend, right? And and the idea that you know you have these people who chose to have these girls brought into their life—they're not the biological parents. Right. That has to have a different kind of impact here when you think about what they're charged with and what they're accused of. Of course, because you just can't believe that someone that would step up to care for a child that that can't rely on their own parents would then turn into the worst kind of abuser. That you can imagine. Yeah, I mean, that's what they're accused of right here. And although they are defending it, saying they've never abused these girls, Layla's death was an accident, and all these injuries are a result of horseplay, gymnastics, accidents, things like that. But as uh, Norman said, you know, we're not only getting an insight into uh, Jennifer Rosenbaum, let's also hear from people that knew Millie very well, um, Millie and Layla. And that brings us now to another witness, Kyle Lambert, who helped care for Millie and Layla. You hear her name constantly being brought up throughout this trial. Let's hear what she had to say when she took the stand. Okay, here's the issue, Norman, when you really think about it. You have so many strong witnesses for the state, people that knew the Rosenbaum's, medical professionals, all saying, pointing the fingers towards abuse. And then the question becomes, what is the defense going to do? Yes, they can, they can cross-examine these witnesses all day, every day, and they're doing a really good job. But what kind of witnesses do they need to call? What kind of expert witnesses do they need to call to rebut a very strong case put forward by the state? I mean, they would have to put on a psychotherapist that would go against what the state psychotherapist said. They'd have to put on um, foster care advocates or foster care experts that can say that there was nothing wrong with the household. And they have to put on medical experts that can say that it's possible that the injuries to Layla were accidental. And that's just tough. Easier said than done, but I don't know. This defense attorney's been doing a really great job of trying to poke some holes in everything we've heard. but. We're waiting to see those witnesses. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back here on Law and Crime. Okay, so another powerful witness there. But again, this is interesting when you have these two defendants here, both facing uh, similar charges. They're both facing aggravated assault, cruelty to children charges, aggravated battery charges. But there is a difference in some of the degrees of responsibility. Uh, she is facing malice murder. He is facing a lesser charge of murder. Um, so the chances of both of them being found guilty what do you think about that? I think because they're represented by the same attorney, that possibility exists. If they were represented by separate counsel, I mean, I would just be trying to drive a truck through the fact that this whole trial is Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. Not so much about Joseph. And I think that Joseph, the jury may dislike him. Right. The jury may feel that he should have figured out what was going on, even if he wasn't responsible. You know, but they can find that he's not criminally liable at the same level that his wife was. So there's a chance that either he could be found not guilty or maybe guilty of lesser charges but not face the same degree as her. Um, then again, they may all be found, they might, both of them might be found not guilty of all the charges. We're going to have to wait and see. Uh, Norman's going to stay with us. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're waiting to jump live again into that Georgia courtroom and we're previewing the Amato trial. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.